Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, it's always tricky to introduce someone who's much better known than you are, but uh, Jeremy Deller is, is one of Britain's best known and, and um, most interesting contemporary artists. He's done a whole range of different things. Recreated the Battle of Orgreave, which was a battle between striking miners and the, and the police, which he made a film. Um, won the, the Turner Prize in 2004. I think for our purposes, Jeremy's interest in both the everyday and the material at a conceptual level gives his work a whole series of, of links with, with archaeology in the, in the very broadest sense and how we think in and through things. And I, personally, I particularly like his recent work on English magic, which is a, a whole series of explorations of, of folk art and belief. And of course, every archaeologist, no archaeologist could, uh, could find a better artwork than a bouncy castle of Stonehenge. So uh, I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I might close this door because I yeah, can yeah, hear it. I, is, I, I, it I, is. It's a people having tea out there. It sounds very it'll, nice for them. But, it'll squeak. I know. Wow. It's like opening a tomb in ancient Egypt or something. Oh, I've lost that. Now. Oh, oh. now. What's happened? I've put the password in. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's not linked. Can you do that all that thing again? I'm just going to yeah. say a few words. Um, all right. All right. This talk is called uh, I'm Not an Archaeologist. And I can preface it because last Thursday I was giving a talk in um, Bristol. And I was talking about this work called Sacrilege, and I got into a bit of an argument with someone. Uh, so I could call this talk. I'm not an archaeologist, but I have had a big argument with a druid. <laughs> this, uh, this woman who um, felt she knew exactly what had happened at Stonehenge was very annoyed by my interpretation of Stonehenge, but also the fact that I, I felt it was a funny... There's humour within archaeology and humour within Stonehenge and these sites, because for a variety of reasons. So I thought I'd just begin with this image, which is taken on this inflatable Stonehenge I made in uh, 2012. There we go. Thank you. It's, um, it's a life-size reproduction of Stonehenge. It's about 100 feet across, and it's obviously freely open to the public, and it was free entry, and it toured Britain, and then it toured London during the Olympics. And since then, it's been to Sydney, Hong Kong, Paris, and next year, I think it's going to Mexico. So it's, it's Stonehenge is traveling the world. But I will come back to that. Um, the beginning, really, for me as an artist, it's quite sensitive, this, is uh, when I did an exhibition in my parents' house. They went on holiday, and I was living at home, and I did a, an exhibition in the house because it was the only place I could work. So I thought I should show you this. This is an image that was used. It's, it's the toilet, obviously, and all the pieces of paper you see on the walls are graffiti from the men's toilets at the old British Library. Which I don't know if any of you went to that, but the graffiti was immaculate. It was incredible. It was pornographic and learned and full of sexual frustration and <laughs> lofty thoughts, all, all mixed up together. So uh, this was a very good project for an artist to start with, really, because it meant I could just do something at home in a domestic setting. It was very easy. Um, I took over the whole house, but weirdly, um, this is a series of paintings I made about Keith Moon, the drummer from The Who. Weirdly, what happens in an artist with your career is you end up doing, being reproduced and sort of um, re-archived and represented to the public. This is an exhibition at the Hayward Gallery where actually my bedroom was recreated, so history being recreated very, very quickly um, for the public to see the work. And wrong, one reason I did this was because often, as an artist, when you show your work, your early work, it's quite embarrassing, most of it. It's not very good. But if you show it in a context that makes sense for the public, they can understand it better. And it actually looks quite good when it's in a domestic environment. But some things taken out of a domestic environment and put in a museum on a white wall lose, I think, sometimes either lose their power or lose the context. And I saw that's something we all sort of struggle with, but you maybe with objects that are far older than this. But um, yes, yeah, so I've even sort of recreated my own career after, after less than 20 years. Um, 
really though, what I'm most interested in is sort of contemporary British history, I think you would call it that, and um, contemporary life in Britain. Uh, this is one work that really shows the way I try and approach subjects and think about things. It was, it was a project that really freed me up from making objects as an artist and doing things like the Bounty Stone Hendry and doing other things that were really work with the public, which is where, where my strength is personally. So this is a project where I um, got a brass band, a traditional British brass band, to play acid house music, which is music from the... Uh, mid to late 80s, which became very quickly associated with a drug culture and a very hedonistic culture and actually became part of a traveller's community and also with the Stonehenge festivals and so on. And so it became this sort of re reawakening, some people thought of this sort of pagan spirit in Britain. And so it became quite, quite closely associated to some of these archaeological sites that we know today. Um, but really, it's, it's really a, a, a piece of music about the 20th century in Britain, the 19th into 20th century, from a country going from an industrial heritage, an industrial base really, to a digital post-industrial state, which we find ourselves in now. So for example, a lot of these parties, these acid house parties, took place in former industrial sites, warehouses, factories and so on. And it was very, very strong in the northeast and northwest of Britain areas that, that had just within years have been totally de demolished really in terms of sort of the uh, political will of the government at the time. So just after the miners' strike, maybe two or three years after the miners' strike, those areas that had been, been almost under siege by the government were, were having these huge parties. And so it became a very politicised form of music very quickly. And so you have this sort of cultural movement that becomes politicised and the government did a lot about civil liberties at the time and the media got very excited about it as they did about the miners' strike. So they have huge things in common. So this I did in 1997, a performance, and we have a performance this weekend in London. Oops, wrong way. This is the band, as they are now, that we work with, that I work with, and they just do performances all over Britain and all over the world they're playing in Berlin soon. So it's a kind of social artwork, it's an artwork that includes music, but music and history is being very closely connected. Mm -hmm. And that diagram is absolutely integral for me, for my understanding of why I made the work. Because without the diagram, you could just say it's just another kitsch music project where one kind of music is played by an unlikely set of musicians in, one style, in, in a different style. So it was very important that we work, I work with a brass band, but I had that backup of, of how, why I wanted to do it. Um, This is an image I show at every talk I give, regardless of who I'm talking to, because I think it's one of the most important, if not the most important image taken in Britain after World War II. Um, it's an image of uh, a man on the right, uh, it's called Adrian Street, he was a wrestler. He worked in that mine, that's him and his father, and in 1973 he went back to the mine, having left it in 1959 as a teenager to make his fame and fortune in London. And eventually he did that as a wrestler and he returned to the mine to show his father, the men behind him, the whole of Wales effectively, um, and the whole of that mining culture, what he'd made himself. And uh, for me, it's totally emblematic of what has happened to this, this country since the end of the Second World War. In fact, we've gone from being an industrial nation to being a, a nation of, of based around services, around entertainment, around the entertainment industry, and so on. But Adrian was actually doing it for real as a human being, and was doing it, forging his path with no help from anyone whatsoever. When I look at this image, I think of many things. It's like, it's like a Renaissance, some sort of Renaissance painting, some sort of uh, Arnold Feeney marriage, you must know that painting, or The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. Um, the sort of return of the prodigal son it has all these ideas around it, but for me, really, I think what it is, and un unconsciously, Adrian is very, a very strong-willed person, as you can imagine, looking like that and, and acting like this. He's tiny as well. He's about my height. He's about five foot six, five foot seven. But as tough, as tough as they come, he's seventy-three. He still wrestles. Well, he actually finished wrestling on Saturday. This is his last ever wrestling match on Saturday in Florida. But for me, this is an image, really, and again, maybe this is how I think about history and art history 
and contemporary life. For me, this is more like uh, the Jerusalem, William Blake, the William Blake poem that has been turned into a hymn. That was uh, really just a poem, which is about what would happen if Christ or someone came from the future or from heaven to Britain in, in an industrial moment, the dark satanic mills, and what would they make of what they saw around them, and how would they really take us out of that world into another world, into paradise. And that's basically what, what Adrian is doing here. He's showing the future to these men. And the future actually doesn't include these people. They're not part of it, as they will find out within about <coughs> 10 or 12 years. Um, so I show that everywhere. I studied art history, I should say that. I didn't go to art college. So I studied art history at the Cultural Institute, I studied Baroque painting. And uh, but before that, I really spent most of my childhood, or it seems most of my childhood, in museums and galleries and being around art. I'm actually technically not a very good artist um, in a traditional sense, but I'm very much at ease in galleries and very much at ease in old churches and sort of ancient monuments and so on. Those are the places I gravitate to. That's probably because of my upbringing. So I was very lucky to be exposed to those things. So that's why I feel I'm quite confident in playing around with them really. That was going to be my other title, was playing with the past, but that just sounds like some BBC Two sort of uh, documentary. <laughs> so we won't go into that. Um, well, can we go with miners again, but this is 11 years later. On a picket line in Yorkshire, there was something called, what's well, been known as now, the Battle of Albury. It was a mass picket that turned into a, 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 a basically a huge riot. But I'm sure some of you here know this, it was filmed by, on TV, and I saw it on TV, I experienced it on TV, like most of us did, and it looked like a medieval battle, because you had the miners dressed like that, jeans and t-shirt, being pursued up a hill by police on horseback, with long truncheons, and then shield formations and so on, which are actually very similar to Roman shield formations, and the techniques are actually very, very similar still, apparently. And uh, it made a great impression on me. I was 18 or 17 at the time, and I just thought that stuck in my mind. And I thought, I want to know more about what I've just seen, because it just seemed to be a quite, a, for me, quite a moment of realization of, about the country and where do I fit into this event, this picture, or this TV uh, report. I don't quite, I'm not quite sure where I fit into this and what, where I should be, and um, it was very confusing. So. I did some research, These are some people you might come into contact with occasionally, uh, I'll go back to them in a second. So I had this idea of reenacting this battle in the style of a reenactment that you might see on a bank holiday somewhere. So I just made up this, pa this poster and sort of burnt it at the edges and um, it was going to be a 15,000 person reenactment of that event with people dressed as police and people as minors, and it would be for the public to enjoy and see. Um, and I managed to do it, but not with 15,000 people, because that's actually impossible to do that, um, unless you have about 30 million pounds to spend on the production. Um, but I did do it, and I did it in 2001. I was very interested in working with the minors, obviously, to hear their side of the story, but also I was very interested in these people, Reenactors, where in Britain, this is a huge scene in Britain, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, reenactment societies, the two biggest reenactment societies are the English Civil War Society and the American Civil War Society. So, civil wars are very, obviously, are very, very attractive to people into history or a certain kind of history. And the minor strike in itself was a sort of cultural and social civil war, without a doubt. And if for anyone that lived through it, they would see it as that. So I, what I wanted was, because English heritage often, but also reenactors, are very interested in calling what they do living history. So, which, and I actually really like it when, people, when you go to a, a somewhere, Sutton Hoo, and someone's dressed up as something, a Viking or whatever, that's probably the wrong term I know, but, um, and they're talking about things and they're making rooms and they're telling you about that stuff. I actually am a sucker for that, totally, I love it. But what I wanted was, when I'd been to reenactments, I'd always, was always disappointed because Reenactments, you know, they have someone doing a commentary, which is interesting, anyway. But the commentary is usually always about the guns, how many guns there were, what kind of uniforms they had, the horses, the, really the sort of the technology and the material of the battle. Never really about why people were, were killing each other or why people from the same, especially when it's people from the same country, what what were the political 
the background or social background to these things. So I was, it was, they were kind of drained of history as I saw them. So what I wanted to do was, was make a reenactment that was absolutely full of history and full of, sorry, not drained of history, drained of politics. Something that was absolutely full of politics, that only had politics in it really, because no one was killed in this battle. But it was a battle, nonetheless. So it was going to be a huge, I wanted it to be a massively political uh, battle and reenactment. Uh, so this is another image from the strike. This is some women's movement again, working against the police. Uh, that's probably some working miners in there, or a working miner with about three or four hundred police getting him to work. So I, what I wanted to do was, was, was work with reenactment societies and make them think about British history, really, about where, where does British history end? Does it end at the Second World War with the, the liberation of Germany, or whatever you want to call it? Or can it go up to the present day, and can it include battles that happened on British soil that are still hugely contentious? The 30th anniversary of this was on Wednesday night, and there, there's still questions about what was really happening during the strike. So it's still all up for grabs, really, as I felt. And also, for me, I wanted those reenactors to come up against real living history because a miner who was in the miners' strike in that campaign is a piece of living history who you can talk to. And because you can't talk to Roman centurions, you can't talk to a Napoleonic general, you, you know, you, can't, you can barely talk to World War II veterans now. So I thought that would be very interesting for them to talk to men their own age who had been part of this because the reenactment world is fairly conservative. If you think about it, it's people who like to dress up as soldiers and carry guns and run around and be told to do things and order and take orders and give them and so on. So there's a lot of former policemen, a lot of former soldiers do reenactment. So I wanted them, to, like I said, to come again up against these miners who are still very angry, still quite bitter about what happened. This is the reenactment, by the way, and see what they made of it. It was, in, it was very interesting because a lot of the reenactors were terrified of the miners. Um, even though they were outnumbered, the miners were outnumbered like three to one. Uh, maybe 600 reenactments, uh, reenactors, or 700 reenactors, and two, 300 miners. They're terrified of them, and so we had to mix up. Miners had to play police, and police had to play miners, and reenactors had to play miners because they actually thought a real revolution would take place. It's in a way kind of showed that the legacy of the strike was still there. That mistrust and fear of of the left or of um, trade unions. Um, so that was interesting. But for me, the reenactment really was about, this again is the reenactment, was really about um, make, having a public inquiry into something, but with a, like a physical performance art public inquiry, where people could go back to the site and there was, a, there was an audience and they could witness this thing again, they could see this thing again. It wasn't accurate at all, really. Um, for a number of reasons, but it was still this thing, this sort of ghost of something happening. In a way, I saw it in, similar to it, to when the police, you know, when there's like really bad, you know, really awful crimes are committed, children are abducted, people are murdered and so on, often the police reenact the crime for the public as a way of jogging people's memory, but also sometimes as a way that they suspect sometimes the perpetrator of the crime will turn up and watch the reenactment. So I did it as a way of having, like, recreating a crime scene, but with a thousand people. And um, so we did that, and we made a film about it, which you can, you can find. And w within the film, you see this mistrust between, or this fear, I would call it fear, actually, <laughs> between the miners and the reenactors. And the miners were fine. They totally knew what was going on. They got it. They got the idea, and they liked it, and they thought it was funny. Uh, and they, they understood why it should happen. The reenactors were a little less um, au fait, at least crew like that, with what, what was going to be why it was happening. Um, anyway, so that's something I did in 2001. It's probably something I'm the most best known for. Um, I work abroad, and I try and work abroad as much as I can. This, is, this didn't happen, by the way. This, this is the fourth blint in Trafalgar Square. I suggested for the fourth plinth, which is where contemporary art is put on an empty plinth in Trafalgar Square. I suggested that um, in 2008, I think, that a car that had been destroyed in Baghdad would be brought from Baghdad to London and put on the plinth and would remain there for six months or a year and just basically rot. Um, it was shortlisted. I was one of six people uh, that was shortlisted and in the end they didn't get it. But 
the idea was something I wanted to pursue. I thought it had, had some sort of... It could work, bringing an ob a large object from a war zone and showing it to the public in a very straightforward, plain way, really. I mean, that plinth is very neutral in a sense. You're in a very unneutral area because you're surrounded by these imperial uh, sites, really, from so the National Gallery, but also South Africa House, um, Australia House, Canada House, and so on, all very close. So the empire is, former empires, you're in the heart of it, really. And, and of course, Nelson is there as well. Um, that's the model I made. Um, so it fitted perfectly, because that plinth was actually meant for someone on horseback, a uh, sculpture of George III, I think on horseback. It was never made because they couldn't get enough money from the public because they didn't like him enough. So uh, that's why it's empty. Um, it was a subscription sculpture. So that's, that's, that was interesting for me, but a man on horseback is more or less the same size as a car. Um, it didn't work, but I did get a car, and actually in a very easy way, because someone else had got two cars out of Baghdad for, um, and was using them for um, sort of a, a, an anti-war uh, performances and he got them out and he's heard I was trying to get cars out and it was very very difficult it was a very difficult moment, it was about 2000, 2008 not a great time to try and be doing that and he said take this car so we got a car and we towed it across America there's a sign on the side, I don't you know if you can read that even, it says this car was destroyed by a bomb in a Baghdad marketplace March the 5th 2007 we towed it across the US with an American soldier and an Iraqi civilian. And we basically stopped off at places, pre-arranged, but not, not with much hullabaloo, to be honest. And we just stopped, parked up, and we just talked to whoever went by. And um, we gave out a flyer explaining what we were doing. That was actually very helpful. It worked very well as a kind of middle point for the public. Because you see something, you're not really not sure what it was. You get given a piece of paper to say this car was destroyed. Blah, blah, we're taking it across America. We have people here if you want to talk about this object. This is towards the end of the tour. We're in 29 Palms in uh, California, which is actually a very, very big marine base. It's where a lot of the Marines do cold weather and hot weather training. Um, so a lot of them would go out to Afghanistan or Iraq at that time. Um, and, and the terrain is actually probably not that different from a lot of, uh, from Afghanistan, certainly. So. We were very nervous doing this because we're basically taking some sort of relic around with us, and um, but it had to be a big object and it had to be an understandable object, especially for the American public, because a car is something, of course, when you're driving, you're towing a destroyed car that has its own meaning as well, and a car really made the country after the after the railways. So we were worried that we would be physically attacked and verbally attacked. For what we were doing, but actually, in the end, we were very uh, uh, surprised. We went to quite right wing areas, we went to the south, Alabama, Texas, Mississippi. We, we, went, we, want, we went wanting to, to take the battle almost to certain places, if you can call it that. Um, but we were very nervous, but it was absolutely fine. And I think the reason why it was fine was because we didn't go as an anti war, it wasn't projected or marketed as an anti-war um, project or event or whatever. It was just something to look at and talk about. And we, and of course, we covered ourselves by having a soldier and an Iraqi with us. And, um, and this is us in Arizona. So it's very casual, as you can see. We didn't have like thousands of people flocking around us because you just don't get thousands of people in the streets in America in most towns, maybe you would in New York or in Boston or somewhere, but most towns are pretty empty. So just randomly people come up, we have no idea what's going to happen from one minute to the next. So that woman in white you can see, who's second on the, the right, no left, she just started talking to us and then she told us that she was actually, um, she'd worked in the bases and her job was to get entertainers over and look after them, like big entertainers who would come and give shows and do stuff with people, and, um, um, and sports stars and rappers and all sorts. And she said, she told us all these stories that we couldn't use because we couldn't verify them about uh, Thai, um, Philippine women being used as prostitutes, and, 
people going crazy on, on and, and getting sort of shooting people and all, all this kind of stuff. I mean, but it was so it's very interesting the way it opened up conversation. Um, most people saw it from their cars. It's in California again, and uh, people taking loads of pictures. That woman was, was taking a picture of her. That's her just afterwards, I think. I just one day I just sat on the back of the, where we were towing with this truck we were towing on and just took pictures of people looking at it. So I have hundreds of pictures of people looking at it. Now, the car is in the Imperial War Museum. It's going, when it reopens, this is it about two years ago, when the Imperial War Museum reopens, it'll be in the central point, really, in the new atrium. So it's an incredible end, really, for this work for it to be there, for this, this piece, this um, exhibit, I would call it. I never called it an artwork, ever. What we were doing was done by an artist in terms of this project, this trip, but the work itself was never referred to as an artwork, and I think if you do that, you start actually taking meaning out of things, when you start thinking of things as artworks, because people just look for the, the beauty of it. And of course, that always does happen when they know, um, because we did put it in an art gallery initially, because there's a bigger show around it. But... Um, it's there, and if you go to the new Input the War Museum and it opens in about three weeks, you should see it quite centrally as you go in. Um, so, for me personally, it's a, very, it's a very satisfying end to that project. I, um, like I said, as a young person, I spent a lot of time walking around places like this. We had friends in the car in Wiltshire, so we were about five miles from Avebury, so I used to go to Avebury quite a lot. Always been interested in these sites the fact that they're free helps and you can wander around them and you can be in the open around these things and um, like with Stonehenge I always liked the idea that we really don't know quite what they were used for and we never will know and until, until we invent time travel there's no way that we will know despite what the druid lady was telling me um, it's, all, it's still open and I think I like that openness and that uncertainty because that gives a great space to work in. I was asked by the Olympic Authority to come up with ideas for gateways into the Olympic Park as, as ways to, to denote um, entrances for the public. So I, I, I gave a presentation, which didn't go down very well. It kind of went down very well and not very well at the same time. Um, <laughs> that we would recreate, we would make not, these ancient structures that look like Stonehenge or similar places and have them as the gateways, because these may have been gateways, from, from, from what we know. They would have been ceremonial spaces. That, that probably is without doubt. There's something happened in these places. So it's a way of denoting that, that something special is through these gates and so on. Um, also, I like the idea that in 2,000 years' time, when the whole Olympic Park is ro and rotted and, and you know, it's underwater or whatever, these things would still be there, and it would just confuse future historians and archaeologists trying to work out why these uh, ancient uh, objects were amongst the Olympic Park. And, and also, uh, you know, the, Olymp the Olympics is an ancient, ancient uh, uh, event, and so it kind of makes sense to have something that's very, very old, or looks very, very old to do with the Olympics. And, the, and wh where I blew it, actually, and where I blew it last week with the Druid, I said, sport doesn't have a sense of humour. Basically, it's, it's not funny. And I wanted to do something that was quite amusing and funny. And with the, the Druid lady, I said I found Stonehenge quite funny. And that's when it all kind of went like that. <laughs> so um, basically, this didn't... It, I, you, know, you know, when you look around the room when you're doing a presentation, some people are just loving it, and others are just absolutely disgusted with you. It was one of those sort of division ones. Also, for me, these sites, like Stonehenge, like Avebury, you know, Stonehenge especially, is, is almost emblematic with Britain or England, you know, this is the, the, the soul of the country, and yet we still don't know what it was there for, what people did there, how they spoke even, and, and I like that, because that's, if that's about Britain, then it's like British identity is absolutely, no one can define it, because we, can't, we don't even know what went on at this place, and we're all meant to think this is the essence of our country. So I like that indefinability about our, our own um, history, but also our, our identity with these, these sites as well, and we can project what we want onto them. So that was something that was, was very interesting for me. This is sacrilege, 
So going back to that first image, this is sacrilege. Um, I was thinking about the Olympics and they had this big thing for the Olympics for artists to make these artworks that were sort of summed up Britain and, your, and, and where you live and all this stuff. It was very, very high-minded. And I thought, why not just make a, a, an inflatable Stonehenge? It's the most stupid idea you could probably have had in your life. <laughs> and, um, and then tour it around the country. So it'd be on tour. the Stonehenge would be on tour. One morning you wake up and you draw your curtains and your local park has Stonehenge outside. And like, what is that doing there? And it would just arrive unannounced. I mean, I, ideally, you'd want it to arrive unannounced and just appear overnight. And... Um, it didn't really happen like that. But people did come across it without knowing they were going to see Stonehenge that morning as they walked their dog. So that was very important, that idea of humour, of playing with history, of, um, of children engaging with something and just enjoying it, really, enjoying your history, even though you don't necessarily... You weren't meant to do that, by the way. I was told off for that. And just, just being able to be around something and enjoy it in a sort of very physical way. And I, uh, it was great to do it. And the, weird, the weird thing is, wherever you go in the world, the reaction is the same. It's absolutely, you know, it's just joy, basically. So, and there's, you know, there's usually some sort of blood is spilt, not as a human sacrifice, but as uh, heads and bit knocked, and there's a bit of crying. But in the terms of the crying versus the laughing, you know, the crying's down there and laughing's up there. So I, I don't feel that guilty when a child starts screaming with a sort of cut head, but... Um, <laughs> also, I learned very quickly that if you want to do an artwork like this, you've got to, you'll, you will be photographed on it as the artist, so you better get something else really good to happen on it, otherwise you're just going to be known to be photographed jumping up and down on this thing. So I often got gymnasts in to perform on it and do um, amazing tumbles and, and some sorts and so on. So that's, this is a picture I really like. And there's others as well, these kids just sort of suspended in the air. And to me, that maybe that is the, that is the moment where there's something slightly otherworldly about it, and that's I did want that as well. I didn't want it just to be funny. I wanted it to be to have these moments when it looks like people are being levitated. So you have this this um, with these photographs certainly the fact that it is there is something special going on, and it's not it is funny, but there's there's other ways of looking at it as well. Um, so photographs like this are, for me are quite important um, showing this boy apparently just being sort of raised above the ground he's, just, you know, he's doing a huge sort of somersault but you know as we know as, well as we don't know sorry as we don't know Stonehenge might have been a place where there were massive parties where people did gymnastics you know we just don't know what happened there basically um, how am I doing for time how long do yeah, I have how am I, do I I might try and show the you know what? I'm going to try and show a piece of film of yeah. Stonehenge. This is really, this is really pushing my sort of technical capabilities. By the way, there's no sound apparently here today, but I'm just going to show you. This is the film I made about from Venice. I'm going right through it. So what happens is a car is crushed, two Range Rovers are crushed, because I hate Range Rovers <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So as the crusher goes down, Stonehenge comes up, and I'll just, well, I'm not going to talk you through it, it's very clear what's going on in real life. <laughs> this is sexual speed, so it's like a very sexual thing as well, like it's going to be racing. <laughs> very quick, it's very funny to watch, it's really, really funny to watch. So this is at Hampstead Heath in 2012. We let on about 120 people at any one time for 15 minutes, and it's absolutely exhausting. It's exhausting for anyone of my age to go on. Just here is a steel yeah, band. There's a steel band playing a song from Voodoo Ray, which is a acid house song, quite a mysterious song. <laughs> <laughs> Chance I met him, he was telling me he, was, he did yoga, isn't he? 70s, and he really wanted to do it. 
Look at his grandchildren. There's a bit of trickery now. This is backwards. Because I wanted to have something that was slightly otherworldly. <laughs> So, um, it was great to do it. Is anyone here from English Heritage? Okay, well, thank you for doing that, actually, and then um, for doing the Stonehenge. And we were going to have it at Stonehenge for one day. And in a way, I'm glad he didn't, because he probably caused like 15,000 car accidents of people sort of driving past Stonehenge. It's a very busy road. Just lorries just jackknifing because they sit they see two of them. <laughs> the English Heritage, we have a very strange relationship with them. We went to Stonehenge on an early morning visit. You can do that for free. Well, not for free, you've got to like, pay a bit extra to get try and match the colours and get the colours worked out. I, just, if you, I don't know if any of you have been, I'm sure you've all been to Stonehenge. We basically went on a cold, foggy February morning. So we basically got the sort of grey, foggy Stonehenge colour. We didn't get the sort of golden... Uh, almost luminescent Stonehenge you might see today or this evening at about eight o'clock. So we definitely got the sort of the, the, the winter version of Stonehenge. Um, but they they were they kind of liked it and hated it at the same time. They just couldn't work out how how it fitted into what they were trying to do and so on, which is a great pity because I'd love love it to go there one day and be not necessarily next to it, like I said I think it's actually quite a dangerous thing, but to be close to it at least. Right, am I going backwards now? I can't work it out. No, I'm not. Okay, so this is it's sort of the final part of the talk. I did a show at the Venice Biennale last year. Uh, I, was, I represented the, uh, Great Britain, as you can see from that. And um, I did a show called English Magic, which is really about the ancient Britain, present and the future, all sort of mashed into one. And weirdly, some of the inspiration I got for the show was coming around this museum. Because for me, a good museum is about time traveling, really, and just going from one room to Neolithic artifacts to then Persian carpets and then um, Impressionist paintings, and you can do it all. And this is one of those great museums of the world where you can do all of that, like those great museums in America and Philadelphia and Cincinnati and, uh, and so on, that where you can just, uh, just time travel, basically. The Carnegie, for example, is, in Pittsburgh is probably one of the greatest for that. So I wanted to create that sort of museum atmosphere, but with sort of uh, with a lot of uh, paintings of contemporary events uh, with an almost mythological spin to them. So this, as you can see, you walk up these stairs into this grand space. It's very like an old-fashioned museum, or almost like a temple or church, the way it's designed. And um, the painting on the back wall is uh, about 30 feet by 20 feet. On, the, on either side of the, the wall are two lyrics by David Bowie. It's, it says, I searched for form and land for years and years I roamed. It's a line from the man who sold the world, but it sounds like some ancient text that someone's dug up or something from the Bible, almost like a prophet in the wilderness. Um, there we go. So the, the bird is huge. The bird is very important. It was meant to be seen from a long way off. And for me, it was like some sort of pre-Christian creature. Um, something from a sort of mythology, really, uh, coming to take revenge. We're getting there, getting closer. There we go, there it is. It's basically a hen harrier, which is a very rare bird in England. It's, it's so rare that actually it's not clear if any are still are living in England at the moment. Um, there's some in Scotland. They're, so, they're rare because they, they like eating grouse chicks, and uh, that's not a very good thing to like eating if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're a bird in Britain because grouse is a big, big uh, money spinner for, for landowners. And in 2005, two of these birds, a male and a female, were observed being shot out of the sky in Suffolk, or North, no, Norfolk, uh, near the Sandringham estate. And it was, it was the only people that day with guns on the estate were Prince Harry and a friend. And uh, he was questioned about it, but the carcasses of the bird con birds couldn't be found, which is not surprising, really. They were sort of uh, whisked away somewhere. 
So it, for me, that became a kind of emblematic moment in British history. I actually read about it on the Daily Mail website, which is actually a very good source of sort of anti-establishment <laughs> stories. Really. And it just stuck with me as, as a story about the land, nature, privilege, power within Britain. So this is an image of a hen harrier returning, a giant hen harrier, and getting in its claws. Not Prince Harry. I thought that was just too naff, really, weirdly. And, uh, but uh, a Range Rover, which as a cyclist is sort of the most, sort of probably the most dangerous thing you can come across in London. Um, so this dominated the room, but it, like, it was, and it was painted, because I felt, you know, what's important if you paint directly onto a wall is you're making a real statement about painting, but also, as we know, the first paintings were painted onto walls, and I wanted it to have that kind of feel to it. Um, the whole room was, uh, had other paintings in. These are Neolithic <coughs> arrowheads. They see that dotted line? Um, some are real, some probably aren't real, they're bought from a variety of places, you know, as you know there's a lot of fakes to do with this, and I probably bought fakes, I bought some, probably some from Africa, from North America, from all over. Um, this painting is about a futuristic event, the burning down of St Helier in Jersey, which is a, 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 a town where a lot of financial uh, organisations are, or are apparently are based, and where a lot of tax evasion happens very opaque, very unclear what goes on in, 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 in that town. It's a very corrupt place, basically. Um, and a lot of money laundering as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a fictitious event that happens in the future when the, the, the taxpayers of Britain go and uh, protest at, at, the, at the banking system there and accidentally burn the city down as a sort of sacking. It's like a sacking, basically. A good old medieval sacking of the town. Um, and that banner you see is one of the emblems of the movement. There might be another banner here, maybe. There we go. There's another banner with the, with the uh, arrowheads around it. These are actually based on diagram, tax evasion diagrams that look like faces if you just take the words out and just put in blocks. So that, if every block of colour there refers to something in terms of um, companies and company structures. That's actually Tesco's. That's how they avoid <laughs> paying tax in Britain. And having shell companies around the world who, anyway, it's called transfer pricing. See that little thing there, that red thing? That was another idea I'd had from being in the British Museum where once I, I held a five pound, a thousand year old axe, hand axe. And I thought that is one of, one of the most incredible things I could do really in a museum is hold this thing. And so we had these two stations where people could hold um, an axe head and a hand axe, you know the difference between those two things, it's very important obviously. And so the public could hold one of these very, very, very beautiful um, axe head, about 5,000 years old, black polished axe head, lent by the Museum of London, which was found near the River Thames, as most of these are in London apparently. And, um, and then a very old, about 400,000 400, year old hand axe. And people just absolutely couldn't get enough of holding these things because you're hot. as soon as you hold it, you realise you, know, you, you become like that person that made it, the person that used it, because it just fits so well and it just looks so great and you know, they're, they're very beautiful objects. Um, people thought they weren't real because they couldn't believe they were allowed to hold them. So that was interesting. Also, uh, thinking about it now, the person that made those must be just laughing, thinking, God, I threw that away because it wasn't working and now, 5,000 years later, people are queuing up to look at it and, and, and uh, marvel at this thing that wasn't working properly. So I quite like the idea of that, because you know, in a way it's a very simple object, but actually incredibly powerful. And I wanted to use the power of these objects and, and maybe take them out of uh, the display, out of storage, and then put them on the walls and use them in a, maybe a, a, a bit of more contemporary way. But, um, give them a, the energy that I think they have around them. Even though, like I said, a lot of them are discarded objects, almost by definition, um, they still, for us, uh, say so much. Um, so, like I said, I had arrowheads going around the walls and really just tracing the, the architecture of the, the space. Um, and giving it a sort of an energy and, and movement as well, because they're all obviously pointing in a direction. I had hand axes from the Museum of London over doorways as almost like sentinels. 
as some sort of uh, protective object. This, these were the, I made three tracks for the film, and these are the vinyl masters, which look like ceremonial objects in themselves. They're very beautiful objects. They're copper, copper covered, um, well, they're copper uh, discs, and they're reflective. They're sort of like mirrors, copper mirrors, and they look like something that might have been found. Some, you know, I think it's the shield, the Wandsworth shield, or the Bassey shield. They have that feel to them, I think. And so I had the, uh, the arrowheads obviously just going around them. As if they're, almost as if the arrows are alive, you know, and that they know to go around these things. And then I had a series of um, axe heads, again from the British, uh, from the Museum of London, in an arrangement. That's just a detail. They were, they were on a wall, and they were basically placed on a wall in rough geographical order of where they were found. It's like a map of the Thames, really. And so they're found either side, and so you had this... this um, this arrangement, and then I put colour behind them. You can just tell there's like pink and orange, so they're sort of they're emanating colour. It's, in a way, it was, it was a way of um, picturing, depicting the sort of their, their, their power, basically, and their, and their, um, their, I don't know what the word is really. I, I just use the word power, and uh, before I get too sort of um, mysterious about it. But um, so that was, and that was called the Small Faces, which of course, as a lot of you know, are very, very famous. British band from the uh, mid '60s, um, just because some of these things sort of look like faces, but I like the idea of connecting the British beat revolution with a revolution in tool making from 5,000 years ago. This T-shirt you might have seen is, is of a hand axe, and it, it says John at the bottom because I had I had five T-shirts made: John, Paul, George, and Ringo, each with a different hand axe, and, and Brian was the last one who was the manager of the Beatles. So it was a, it was, a, it was about the relationship. The revolution, the rock, rock revolution of the uh, 1960s, and the rock revolution of making axes. Whenever that was, we can argue about how many years ago that was. So it's about rock, the meaning of rock, basically. Um, that's me just laying them all out to try and work out how how well. They're. You could probably identify some of these for me if you, if you want later. But like I said, they're, they're quite a sort of motley crew of. Uh, of arrowhead sport in all different places, probably very unethical of me, I'm sorry, but anyway. In the next room there was uh, a very big mural, that's about 20 by 25 foot mural of William Morris, who's a, for me a great hero of mine for a number of reasons. Um, obviously a great, he had great interest in, in, um, in ancient Britain, he lived, you know, he went to school near to Avebury in Marlborough and went there a lot and wrote about it. And so his, his work in preserving ancient buildings as they were being sort of destroyed by the Victorians who thought they knew what they were doing in terms of church interiors and ad exteriors. And that's him throwing Roman Abramovich's yacht into the lagoon in Venice. Because in 2011, Abramovich turned up with this yacht. So it's called Luna. It's a 377 foot long yacht. And they parked it and blocked the view and did all these other things. And everyone was outraged by it. And uh, so. Mrs. Morris taking revenge. So there's a lot of re revenge in the exhibition, actually. Sort of wish fulfillment uh, with these ancient, you know, he's a colossus literally here, but also he's a colossus in terms of world culture. We don't, probably don't realise that so much in the UK. We, you know, we take him for granted, but actually in the world, his influence is huge. And he's known throughout the world in the way that most British people might not be um, from that era. And um, so here he is, like Poseidon taking revenge. And that's exactly what he would have done if he was that big. He would have put, because he had gotten, <laughs> as you may know about Morris, he had these fits of temper where he would destroy inanimate objects if he didn't like them or get very, very upset. So he probably would have destroyed Roman Abramovich's yacht. And let's face it, that would have been an amazing thing to see. Then, almost like with the hand axes, next to Morris, we had Morris material in the room, but also I was very interested in Russia and the moment when Russia turned and became a different kind of economy, the chaos of, of, of the post-communist years. And all of that meaning, all that history, is actually in these small objects. These were the tokens, most of them are tokens and certificates given to workers in state uh, industries to give them a share of their industry. Actually, as, you, as we know, know, those tokens were valueless, or they were bought up en masse by people like Abramovich and sort of criminals that he was working with, and they were 
people were, were totally sort of bereft and left with nothing. Or they sold them for, for not much money to these people because they were so poor. So by hook or by crook, these, were me these are meaningless objects, but they have incredible power and the stories behind them are just are sort of like uh, eye-watering, really. So you have this little bit of paper and it actually refers to an aluminium factory in Siberia and all the things that were going on and all the people who now we know, um, quite famous, you know, these oligarchs and so on, get doing all these things to people. So it's just the stories, really. There's other things about pyramid selling as well in those. But I just liked, well, liked, in the, maybe not the right word, I was really interested in the power of, of, the, of the small object and the stories that they were telling there. This is the room from the film, that showed the film. This is the Range Rover being crushed. A crushed, destroyed two Range Rovers in the film. And that's the Range Rover you see in, on the screen being turned into a, uh, a bench. I'd made a banner a few years ago that just said a Range Rover crushed and turned into a bench. And then I actually got the chance to do that, which was very satisfying. And that, uh, so you actually sit on the Range Rover you see being destroyed. Um, this is the last room. I'm, I'm, I've probably got a few more minutes. Yeah, just a couple more. Okay, this yeah. is the last room. It's the map of Britain. Those lines are actually the Ziggy Stardust tour of Britain in 1972, 1973. And I like the fact that it looks like some weird ley lines or some weird route, trade routes or something. In a way, it is. I mean, it's, it's someone going out and changing people's lives by their own magic, effectively, by their, the entertainment. It's a very old idea, really, going on tour and, and <coughs> performing to people. And in the room, I had images taken from the tour, but also taken on the same days of the tour, of things that were going on in, in the UK. And inevitably, because it was that, those years, there was a lot of um, trade union problems, but also Northern Ireland was a massive uh, issue because Bloody Sunday had happened the day after his tour had started. So the whole tour was sort of infected by bombing campaigns, punishment mm -hmm. beatings and so on. So you have these two versions of Britain at the time. You have this, and then you have this. And a lot of it really is about youth and how youth, uh, the decisions you make as a young person and what uh, affect you for the rest of your life. So going to this concert would have this uh, amazing effect on your life, life-changing experience. But then also being in this happening to you would have the same life-changing experience. I was very worried about juxtaposing these images. It might have looked very glib, but actually when you see you saw them all together, you realised it was a room about identity and youth, effectively. Um, I think there might be one more image. Oh, that's the yeah. This is the last image, basically. I don't even. It's not. This talk doesn't even end. It just sort of fizzles out. But um, this is uh, this is one image I really liked. It's 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 from it's an image from the Hammersmith Odeon. This is the last concert Bowie gave as as Ziggy Stardust, and it's just the audience waiting outside. And I thought it was quite interesting because it's we're all working together with David Bowie. And now I think I know why it says that because of. Uh, this was a moment in British history when no one was working, apparently, because they were on strike, or it seemed that every, there were a lot of strikes, there's a lot of blackouts and so on, because of um, minor strikes, mainly. And so I think that's why it says that. But I love that image, just looking at all the, you know, talking about archaeology, just looking at all the hairstyles and the clothes. And that really is, and you can look at that for hours, based on that image. But um, thank you. Thank you for that, and uh, is it questions or something? Yeah, if there are questions. Okay.